In urban barber shops throughout America, there are conversations. Conversations that guide, uplift, and sometimes misinform. I am not a role model. Parents should be role models. Is this a barber shop? Is this a barber shop? Yes, yes, it is. Is this a barber shop? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we can't talk straight in the barber shop. Then where can we talk straight? We can't talk straight nowhere else. You know, this ain't nothing but healthy conversation. This. Oh, There's been a cliche that a black man in this country had either athletics or show business, and that was about all he could make it big in, and, and you know, for years. That's not true anymore. With that in mind, would you still tell a 12-year-old kid of your own to go into... And call the man Muhammad Ali! His mama named Clay. I'm gonna call him Clay. <laughs> that right, that right. He gonna always be Clay to me, huh? Your chances of being a great fighter, or good enough to make a good living, is about 100,000 to one. And if you spend the most of your life trying to be a fighter, and you get hurt or you don't make it, your whole life is ruined. It's too late to get education. It's too late to look for a trade or something to fall back on. I say, no, take your education, take your mind while you quick for developing, go to school, learn to read, learn to write, be a mechanic, be a doctor, be a lawyer. Go now, learn, get your mind conditioned, spend one day. Same with basketball, same with football, same with baseball. You can't be like Muhammad Ali or Joe Frazier. And don't think because I made it, I'm going to tell you to go box. No. Get your brains together, box the exercises, but get your brains together, get educated, and get a trade. Because you might not make it, and there's too much risk involved. No. Go to school. Go to school. Go to school. Go to school. Let's make this clear. I love basketball. I love the barbershops in my community. Basketball and barbershops have been married in conversation for over 50 years. But nobody in the barbershop ever warned me about the cruel statistical truth that basketball presented. Until Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu did in 1988. There were a million black boys last year that wanted to play in the NBA. Of that million, only 400,000 will even make it to play high school ball. Of that 400,000, only 4,000 will be able to make it to play college ball. Of that 4,000, only 35 will make it to the NBA. Of that 35, only seven start. And the average life in the NBA is four years. So the real problem is we have a million brothers looking for seven full-time jobs that last four years. In the early 60s, there were very few positive TV images for black boys. I mean, it was terrible. It was so bad I can remember when my friends were excited when Buckwheat knocked out Alfalfa. And a few years later, Mr. Rogers shared his waiting pool with a black policeman. Now you can call it corny, but it wasn't to me because I saw myself for a brief moment. All of the negative imagery left young Reginald's mind the night his mother called him into the living room to see something on TV. So my mother calls me into the room to see these two black giants on TV. Her exact words were, that's Bill Russell, he's six foot nine. The other guy's Wilt Chamberlain, he's seven foot two. And they're the best basketball players in the world. At that exact moment, I fell in love with the sport. Because these two men represented strength and power to me. For years, black barbershops have held a vital role in the mental development of black families, particularly black boys. For many boys who don't have fathers or grandfathers, it can serve as a wisdom well of ideas and thoughts. From comedy to politics, everything is discussed in a black barber shop. <laughs> that's right, that's right. He gonna always be Clay to me. I'll... His mama named Clay. I'm gonna call it Clay. Mm -hmm. that's right. One of my greatest memories was the time when my barber, Andy, said to me, I heard you're a pretty good baseball player. I instantly felt like a hero. All the barbers in the shop told me that one day I was gonna make it to the majors. Their influence made me want to be a pro athlete. Now, my mother was still badgering me about the value of education, but I didn't care because I literally only knew two kids in the Bronx, in my area, I should say, that valued grades. One of them was Gregory Wilson, a kid who was a gifted athlete and just loved going to school. And the other one was Big Collie. Big Collie was a six foot five kid 
who didn't play basketball. Everybody made fun of him. He sat in front of the class. People threw papers at the back of his head, but he didn't care. He was just a quiet six foot five kid. And the thing that pushed me away from the types of people like Big Collie, he wasn't cool. He didn't have the latest clothing. I wanted no parts of that. An added attraction for Reginald and so many black boys was the cool factor. NBA players had clothing, money, and style. Along with the mixture of hip hop, large TV contracts, and sneaker deals that attracted so many black boys to a world that was almost impossible to reach. When I started this project, I wanted to send a simple message to kids, parents, and barbershop cheerleaders. It's okay for kids to dream of becoming a pro athlete, but there's so many more options besides running and jumping if they secure a solid education. I am not a role model. But after doing my research, it brought me to a familiar place of uncertainty. Mainstream media likes to use that term with African-American athletes to just say that they're so athletically gifted but they don't take into consideration the preparation that comes with that. They think LeBron just woke up one day and is this, this specimen and was able to do all these things. No, he works hard. One thing I've learned, the hardest thing to convince an athlete, a young athlete, uh, especially ones that come from, look like me, is the importance of an education. I say I'm at a white school. I said, how many of your kids want to play pro sports? Less than 10% raised their hand. I said, what do you want to do? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. But when I go speak at predominantly black schools, 90% of the kids want to play sports. But there are other issues as well. I want you to imagine you and your child walking down the street and coming towards you is LeBron James. Would you recognize LeBron James? If in that same street, Beyonce Knowles started walking towards you. Would you recognize Beyonce Knowles? And if Jeffrey Kenny started walking towards you, would you recognize him? Would you know who he was? Because this is how we learn. We learn by who we idolize. We all grew up wanting to idolize a famous celebrity, a famous actor, actress, an artist, an architect, or someone that we found personally or media-drivenly relevant. Hold up, man. I thought this was about basketball and a bopper chop. It's getting deep. And for every 1,000 black boys who finish high school, only 156 are ready for college or a career. That's only 15.6%. The disparities report found from the third grade through the eighth grade. Black boys in New York City had the lowest English proficiency rate, just 13.9%, and the lowest math proficiency rate of all students, 16 0.7%. Once you start to fall behind from a literacy standpoint, it becomes really difficult to catch up, to catch to up, catch up, to, catch to catch up. Charles Barkley once said, I am not a role model. In a simplistic way, he's right. But this is not a simplistic problem. Who are the role models for these kids? They're your teachers, pastors, Coaches, athletic directors, school board members, community activists, politicians, principals, entertainers, and yes, athletes. And let's not forget our beloved barbers who never receive enough credit for help shaping the youth of our community. <laughs> That's right.
You're watching the Greatness 5 channel, feeling your history in minutes. Subscribe now. Hey, there's four groups of people that can actually change all of what we saw in this video. Group number one, the kids. Education is not what it was 40 years ago. And it's not the end all be all, but you still need a plan and you need to move fast because the new technology is not waiting on people struggling to finish high school. Now group number two are the kids dreaming to make it to the NBA. You heard Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu's statistics. It was hard back in 1988. It's even harder now to make it to the NBA because of the influx of players coming from Europe and Africa to the parents. Now I know it's hard raising kids today, so I'm not here to blame you. If you've attended more of your child's games than parent-teacher conferences, that's a problem. The final message is to the community. If you're not willing to offer your time, money, expertise, or even vote to change this, then why are you offering your opinion? Simplistic opinions, like just stay in school, they don't mean anything to our kids today. They need to see you. Okay, folks, that's just my humble opinion. I'll see you next week on the next episode of Greatness 5, The Legacy Series.